every piece of artwork that you see in the game is built by a community of artists. The dirt on the tires gets there because someone has to put it there. The scratch on the inner side of the fender because a rock might have jumped up and hit it. Everything that moves in our game, the wheel on the warthog rotating, the little antenna bouncing up and down like that, the shotgun spitting out a cartridge. The walls and the light fixtures. Smoke trails, dust effects, lightning. They flush out the world, make it feel a lot more real. The guys that have the biggest burden are the environment artists. They have to build, essentially, the entire world one of the areas we were working on was a warehouse. When it was handed to me, it was a big box. It was a void. We worked to essentially design the overall look. You have to create a world that a player just wants to get lost in. These sweeping alien vistas, these giant foreigner spires, and green rolling hills and blue skies. It's a stylized realism. What's important to this space? There's my exit. There are my places to get cover. That gives us a three-dimensional picture, and we start building it. We'll get the basic forms in, then we'll do a layer of basic lighting, then we'll do a layer of basic texturing. The biggest challenge in front of us was how were we going to convert these assets from Halo 2 into this next-gen HD content. I don't think there are any developers who are happy that it's a high-def world now. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just a pain in the ass for all of us. You have to scale up. We need to have four times the size of textures four times as much content, just to create the same experience that we had with Halo 1 and Halo 2. It's a brand new console. I mean, what we found was more powerful engine, a lot more work for one artist. Xbox 360, there's a screaming for more detail, so we've got to provide it. This is one of the things that's going to set apart Halo 3 from Halo 2, just the sheer number of tufts of weeds and grass to sort of help them blend into the ground and the terrain. I know that if there's one out of place, like when the game ships, every time I run by that in multiplayer, I'll see that one blade of grass and I'll be very upset. <laughs> so I tend to get a little obsessive about it. Art and design is like almost the exact opposite of each other. I'm always trying to add something that he wants to get rid of or he's trying to add something that I want to get rid of. First person shooters are given a lot of bad publicity because this room's filled with crates. We'll give them a beautiful environment, perfectly composed, lit, and then he goes, I'm just gonna put a few crates. Don't worry, just a few. <laughs> then you got purple crates and you got the green crates. And, and then there's, oh, don't worry. These crates are only here temporarily. You're gonna turn them into something really cool. And then you find out so long as it stays exactly the same proportions as a crate. Our combat rests heavily in the fact that we have a fair amount of cover. The designer will grab the ugliest crate in the world when they go, hey, this is a great place to fight around. And then the artist will come up and go, that's a box, like it's pretty ugly. Here's something cool. The designer will come in and be like, this is gorgeous, but this is an absolutely awful space to fight bad guys in. Tell them to drop everything and yeah. recraft this. This space needs to be fun before it's pretty. Art really likes rolling beautiful hills and completely open environments, and we're like, what are you gonna do in there? We need to throw crates Grab the in. warthog smoothly. That's yeah, but for <laughs> infantry oh. encounters. Oh, oh, my warthog fell over. One of the things Halo is really known for is the vehicles. Car vehicles really eat into the dirt and bank into turns and have a lot of mass. Jamie comes to me with an idea for a brute vehicle that was a little bit like a ride-along lawnmower. It's called the chopper because it will literally chop you up. Before starting work on the brute chopper, we discussed the brute. Look, it has soiled itself. The brutes are taking a lot more precedence in this game. To give the brutes more depth, they need to have a history too. And one of the ways to show a history is vehicles that they created. So I look at the brutes, I try to imagine what their home world is like. Maybe they're from a place where they hammer ore and there's lava and magnetism. And I say, okay, well, how do I build a magnetized metallic lawnmower that's fun to drive and shoot people with? I'm gonna take Travis's yellow and stick it on the chopper because I think it looks cooler with the tone of the metal. But the hover technologies, it's all Forerunner Covenant, so it's all gonna be like a bluish purple. You can think of the brutes as building their stuff like in a chop shop. They go in and just tear the crap out of old Forerunner technology. To me, the brutes look like guys who ride Harleys. They just do. Large wheels, lots of metal, leather. Our concept artist put a canopy on it, but it started to pull away from what we needed gameplay-wise. We want this to be vulnerable as well as brutal. If there was a canopy behind the brute and the brute passed by you, you couldn't shoot him in the back of the head as he went by. We need balance, and the balance is from the front, don't mess with this. From the back, take it away. 
The complement to this is the Prowler that Travis Brady worked on. The Prowler is sort of our brute equivalent to the Warthog. I wanted this to look really vicious from the front, sort of like an angler fish. You see it's got a fin here. The pipes on the inside are like fish gills. If you've seen any Discovery Channel shows of these angler fish, they're pretty brutal. They have this massive mouth that like swallows you up. It's got sharp blades, it's got teeth. This looks like something you wouldn't want to get in the front of. If it burns, bleeds, splatters, drips, smokes, or blows up, ah! I'm in charge of it. Every individual projectile needs to be detected against what type of material it impacts. When you shoot, you leave a decal, which is a small bitmap. If you shoot at the same spot enough times, the system has to be smart enough to say, oh, there's already a decal there. Don't draw another one. And it's a very complex system. You got more pixels per screen, which means everything takes more time to create. In Halo 1, we only had one bone in the face, and that was the jaw. And so the jaw would just do this. Halo 3, we're looking at some characters that have over 30 bones. So now we can do some pretty full expressions. Oh, come on. Impress me. Stop! Character rigging 101, which is vertex weighting, and that's where you would assign the uh, vertexes on this face mesh to the skeleton. You can grab the face flags and animate them around and get any kind of facial expression you want. Angry emotions on the eyes, slide them up on the mouth. There's something about modeling someone that doesn't exist that never really translates as well as modeling someone who does exist. There's personality in your face that's just hard to invent. That's why we thought using our heads would be a good idea. There's a whole ton of people in the game. Michael Wu, Marcus, Damian. I've got a lot of asymmetry in my face, so I have to move the nose one way, the eyes the other. and Make sure your self-esteem is in check when you start modeling your own head. <laughs> the bread and butter of animation is all about bringing emotion to the game. There's this little unsung rule, the 357 rule. Design is going to want characters striking other characters to be three frames long. So quick, responsive, great for gameplay. In three frames, that can be um, a pose from here, to the hit, to back, and then to the neutral again. Animation would like seven frames, get some more character into it. We could potentially have the character stare the other character down, cock his fist back for the first frame, second frame he gets even further, third frame he gets even further, and then he starts following through on the consecutive frames until he gets to that seventh frame and hits. 10 minutes later, I'm done with my beautiful expressive melee. Uh, that's not a game anymore, it's a movie, unfortunately. Sometimes we have to edit our animations to cater to that, and sometimes we have to edit them a little too much, and it hurts. Artists are fantastic bitchers. Some of us are worse than others. They hate the idea that their art has to be <clears throat> called done. It's never done, never done. You just run out of time. Poor Lee has been doing storyboards for two and a half years now on the same scenes and reiterating them. Which idea would you like to keep? And I said, I want to keep all of them. And then when I do make a choice, they say, well, we were joking, there was no choice. We are taking all your ideas away. There's a scene that's been my favorite scene right from the beginning, and it's truth's death, right? I mean, the truth is kind of fighting, being floodified. The Arbiter's standing behind him and you know, with his sword, and it comes right out of his chest, and we're, we're looking at the front of the truth. You know, as a director, I'm really married to, and I really want this shot to happen, and we might have to sacrifice other things. The artists are always going to take it absolutely as far as they can until some engineer comes over and starts throwing things at them and saying, no, you cannot do that. We're throwing a lot of things at you, multiple characters, multiple vehicles, weapons. More polys, denser textures, more detail in the textures. Making sure that the smoke wisps in just the right way. Artists tend to think broadly outside the box, whereas engineers dream more in black and white. Artists conceive of something that goes far beyond what the possibilities are and then strive for that and see how close they can get. It's all about trying to cram as much stuff in as he can. Every now and then, it'll catch my eye still. Wow, I can't believe we were able to pull that off. 